but I'm, I'm really delighted that we have Stephanie Hare um, uh, with us uh, today. Um, and we're going to spend a little bit of time, she and I, just chatting around. Um, as, as you will probably all know, uh, Stephanie is a, a very well-known uh, researcher and broadcaster, absolutely focused on, on some of the big challenges around technology and ethics, uh, with a fascinating kind of global perspective as well on what, what's happening. So, Stephanie, if you'd like to, to come and join us. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much for a uh, uh, sort of fairly, fairly late notice kind of coming and, and, and joining and I us. I just got my flu jam, so... <laughs> there you are. You're now qualified to speak yeah. <laughs> at our events. Um, uh, I detect you may not share quite the level of optimism um, that, that was represented there, you know, in terms of that came out from, from today's, today's sessions. But I, I know that you are, uh, while you are, a, you know, a have many criticisms of what's happening in technology. You're also somebody who fundamentally believes that we can get tech right and tech can be a positive force for good. So what are the things that you think we absolutely should be striving for in terms of applying purpose to technology to drive better outcomes, whether it's for society, people, the economy, planet? What are the things that, that you th would really like to see happening? Well. My Christmas wish list for more ethical technology would involve the United Kingdom supporting Lord Clement Jones, who was here this morning in his bill for a moratorium on automated facial recognition technology. I would love to see the United Kingdom lead the world in that. And this doesn't mean, I've heard a lot of um, questions about this in some of my work, so I'll just specify what I mean by this. If you want to use facial recognition technology to unlock your phone, knock yourself out. That's between you and your device. It's not your raw biometric, it's hashed. It's not stored anywhere, and it doesn't affect anyone. What I'm talking about is the very worrying proliferation of watch lists in this country by the private sector, which has no democratic oversight, no accountability, all the, the lovely conceptual topics that we were just discussing are not being lived in this country. Any one of us could just start keeping a private watch list, which seems to me to be a real license for racism and xenophobia, which as an immigrant to this country, I already feel very sensitive to. Um, I'm one of those citizens of nowhere that our former prime minister apparently doesn't like, which is really hard when you've invested your entire adult life in this country and volunteered here and taught children here. <laughs> We've got a very worrying social climate. And you put tech on top of that, you can do some very dangerous things. And I know there's a, a terrible Godwin's law that you're not supposed to talk about the Second World War in a discussion of technology, but I hope you'll indulge that for just a moment because I trained as an historian and I worked with interviewing someone who built the counterterrorism apparatus in France, a liberal democracy during the Second World War, but also during the Algerian War, which was when that country was not invaded, was democratically elected governments persecuting Algerian Muslims who were French citizens at the time, and it persecuted them on the grounds of their religion, their political affiliation. I saw how a liberal democracy mapped out all of the existing data sets that were used to persecute enemies of the state, even though they were citizens purely because they were religious and purely because they wanted independence, which they got, by the way. So if you were to put the kind of technology that we are building today and that I, for better or for worse, and we can happily discuss that, have helped to build, I'm very aware of it. I don't approach this as an academic question. I approach this as someone who's had to be in the room making design decisions and implementation decisions and asking, but what happens if we, if we sell this to a different country? I don't agree with a lot of the attitudes of people I've seen in Silicon Valley who say it's not their responsibility how their technology is used. They, they think technology is neutral. I don't think technology is neutral at all. So in terms of my wish list, practical wish list, one, this country leads the world in ethical technology. We have a moratorium. I'm not calling for a ban, just a pause. I would like to see Lord Clement Jones lead a world-leading demonstration of what it means to do democratic accountability for tech. 
expert testimony filmed on the BBC, on every social media platform, so that every citizen in this country, from children and parents and teachers, to the private sector, to law enforcement, the security services, and all lawmakers and journalists will have to actually learn what facial recognition does, how it relates to concentration camps in the west of China, which private sector companies are building it, which ones have taken people's data without their consent, without their knowledge, to train their algorithms. And then to hold those companies to account to say, given the risks of your tech, what are you doing to mitigate it? And if they can't demonstrate that convincingly, then we don't allow it in Britain. The, what else are you seeing around, around the world in terms of, um, cause, you know, put the UK into that into international context. So, you know, you, you go from uh, uh, kind of a UK context to all the way to the kind of issues of the Uyghurs in China. So, what's in between, and, and what are we missing in the gaps in terms of um, how other countries? Because because these technologies are being used very very widely across uh, yeah. in terms of state apparatus across. Countries. Well, on the one hand. You're hearing a lot of talk about a US-China tech cold war and a division and a splinter net between two different models. And that leads to a really interesting question if we were to look at this globally about who will win, not just the battle of tech, but the battle of ideologies because all of, those, all of the technology, as I'm sure we've all discussed today, are infused with values. And China's doing quite well at selling its surveillance technology to the global south. It's doing very well in Africa. It's doing very well in Latin America. It's infused the selling of this technology as part of its Belt and Road Initiative. And we've seen the United States, not just under this current administration, although certainly it's very transactional, but it was happening even before, really withdrawing its leadership role. And again, we can, we can debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's definitely a thing. And the European Union has certainly withdrawn a lot of its, its investment because of the financial crisis starting from 2008 onwards. We just don't have the money to invest globally. That's created a vacuum and an opportunity. China's got the money and they're selling. So we have, I think, about probably from now to the next, let's call it a decade, just to be, just to be realistic. Who is going to build the 5G infrastructure that's going to underpin the world? The United States blew it and didn't develop its own 5G capability for all sorts of really interesting reasons that we can discuss later. We've got Ericsson and Nokia here in Europe, and then we've got Huawei. Those are your leaders. So that's important to understand because 5G is going to be everywhere and it's going to be helping us to create, generate, traffic, more data than ever before. And we already are terrible at protecting data we are terrible at cybersecurity. And I know that we live under the um, golden auspices of the GDPR, but I'm actually not particularly convinced that the GDPR does what everyone seems to think it does. I know there's an entire constituency because I hear from my uh, fans on Twitter, some of whom sound like a very relaxed bunch, um, that GDPR is great and the problem is just it's not being enforced. I sort of feel like the, the analogy to that comment I would make is as a woman, you're not supposed to get sexually harassed at work and pregnancy discrimination should never happen at work. We have laws for this, it's on the books. We all know it shouldn't happen and it happens all the time. So I guess I look at that as a woman and go, those laws don't really work. HR is on the side of the company, not the employee. Women are just suffering this. And that's sort of the, the, the parallel I guess I would make with GDPR is unless we really enforce it, people will just end up dismissing it. It won't work. How can we live in London and have all of these cameras taking our facial images, but the GDPR says that you're not supposed to take people's biometrics without consent? The answer, of course, is there's a loophole. If you say it's in the public interest, if you say it's about security and counterterrorism, fighting crime, you can do it. But you can make that argument for anything. Like, who doesn't want to fight crime? Who doesn't want to fight terrorism? And that's how you end up like China. <laughs> they are going to use that argument. They are building an entire society about control that they say is about security. So, so, so where do we fit? So, so in your mind, how do you then, where, where does, how do you balance that? Because, because security mm. is, a, is, a, 
is a public good, it's an individual good as well. Mm. So, so in, your, uh, in terms of your approach and your thinking, kind of where, where do you strike that, that balance? Because clearly it can be used clearly as an yeah. excuse, but. Well, look, <laughs> I wish I was sitting up here for, with you uh, with all the answers. Um, I'm taking a really different approach in my work these days, which is not to come and sell you answers or tell you that I have the answers. My goal is to democratize this conversation and make it as inclusive and diverse as possible. So I'm writing a book that is coming out next year, and my goal is to roadshow it to every computer science and engineering company and department in a university and at high school level that will have me. So I can talk to the next generation of people who will build tech and test their critical thinking skills that I have been very lucky to be on the receiving end of some incredible training in my time. I'm now you know, old than the next generation. I want to talk to the young generation of builders and makers and doers and see if they are thinking about this. Are, are your engineers being trained to think about geopolitics? Are your engineers trained to think about society holistically in what we would call an arts and humanities framework? And I'm not always convinced that they are. And ditto, that means we need to equally get into the arts and humanities departments and talk to them about how are they bringing their wonderful thinking and training into the world of people who design, build, sell products you know, make the laws that are gonna to have to regulate it, who's going to help Lord Clement Jones get this bill passed, right? It's, it's gonna be tech people, but it's also going to be everybody else. So I feel like, if anything, the role I'm trying to have now is to, to challenge myself to ask the toughest questions, the most useful questions, the questions that lead to change. If I'm still here talking about tech ethics in a few years, I will be really depressed because I will feel that we're just still in the principles and guidelines and workshops stage, which I think is a, an important stage, but I just hope we don't get stuck in it. I want to see the products that we're going to build. I want to see privacy be profitable. I want to see the tech we're building that will protect children. We're raising an entire generation of kids who are datafied from the minute their mom posts her first trimester pregnancy scan on Facebook to share very joyful news, that kid is tracked and will be tracked throughout their whole life. And all of the toys that are being built about them, all of the education tech that's being sold about them, all of the biometrics of children in the United Kingdom that are being taken, still without any legal basis in Scotland and Northern Ireland, they're only protected in England and Wales by the Protection of Freedoms Act of 2012. How can you have different civil liberties for different children in this country? And it's not with, like we don't know it. We all know it. I'm telling you now. But like people have known it. That was in 2012. We're almost in 2020. That's eight years that no one has fixed that. And parents don't really know. Parents are exhausted. They've got so many forms to fill out and things to do. Who's going to like take it to the mat and fight for kids' biometrics and go, who are the companies that are building that again? What are they doing with the kids' data? Do the kids consent? Can kids consent at all? If they can't, how do we protect them? What kind of internet are we building for children? Kids are using a, a tool that was built for grown-ups. The internet is mainly used for porn and like cat videos and all the other stuff that we're doing. It's not for children. So like what are, what are we doing to help protect kids? And I don't mean this in a sort of who will think of the children way. I mean it in a sense of like we've got a pedophile problem and a grooming problem. We've got kids being cyber bullied. We've got really high levels of anxiety and depression for kids. You know, and wait till they find out what's already online about them and that we, their grown-ups, either put on with very good will or allowed to be put on. And that's why I'd like to sort of, you know, to take it full circle. As much as I, I love to be here and I want to hear from all of you on these things, I am desperate to get in and talk to the engineers who are building it because I'm not convinced that it's going to happen from law and regulation only. And I think we can do a certain amount to raise the public knowledge about this through excellent um, media and research, all of the amazing researchers, so how do we fund them to keep it going? But I actually think we're gonna have to really engage with the people who are making it. You know, they're financially right. incentivized to build stuff that sells, not stuff that protects us. Well, I, I think that has actually been a theme throughout the day today of, of companies talking about that and talking about how they are trying to um, uh, build the processes and the awareness and the understanding 
you know, within their organizations, but also within the, the wider kind of developer uh, community. But mm. clearly, clearly, we're only at the, at the beginning of beginning of that journey. Um, Stephanie, we've run out of time. Um, I, I think I think everybody will agree um, a very kind of impassioned and 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 a kind of very clear perspective on some of the real risks um, mm. around that we do face around these new technologies. Um, and I think the uh, a real kind of call to action, I think, for the UK um, in terms of this kind of question of kind of these kind of the battle of global values uh, in a way, and 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 the the potential that we have to imbue the next generations of technologies with with some kind of clear clear values. And it's as you say, it's very very uncertain about how that that plays out. But um, uh, I'm sorry we've run out of time. But uh, if you'd like to join me in thanking uh, Stephanie for joining us, thank you.